Hello everybody, this is Dr. Willow Ariella coming to you to talk about conducting a good experiment, chapter 7. Uh, looking at some additional um, important pieces from chapter 6. Uh, so the authors of the text go into types of participants and how you choose them. And like most aspects of the uh, of research, the um, participants that you would choose would depend on your research question, the literature review, so what other people have done and um, have been successful with. Uh, so um, that's another reason why your literature review is so important because uh, that will help you determine who the best uh, participants are and how those participants will be chosen. Um, and they discuss um, uh, some of the advantages and disadvantages of um, selecting uh, participants based on precedent and um, uh, like just about everything in this world, there are advantages and disadvantages to um, going by what uh, other people have done. Uh, so, choosing um, uh, choosing one group of participants, like college students or um, certain animals, can limit the generalizability of um, results. And generalizability is important in research for reasons that we've discussed already. Um, so it's just, you know, uh, something to keep in mind when you're thinking about who your participants are going to be, how easily it will be to obtain those participants. Sometimes ease isn't the only um, reason that you choose a particular group. Uh, it's also, you know, who are the best uh, participants for the study. Um, and so they mention availability does not guarantee that the researcher has selected the best or m most appropriate uh, participants. That's why um, choosing college students may or may not be the best group of participants. <laughs> it's really weird to watch yourself in a camera. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, you, you have to weigh the pros and cons in choosing who will be um, part of your study. Um, and how many you choose will be um, based on a variety of factors, money, time, availability. Um, you also need to consider nuisance variables uh, and who is in your, uh, your group, your sample. Um, they discuss uh, a reason to use uh, stratified random sampling um, that was also uh, discussed in Chapter 4. Um, power. So uh, power is related to uh, statistics, and um, in statistics there is a concept of um, power which relates to probability. So how... Um, strong your uh, power results or power um, uh, test is uh, will relate to how um, significant your results are. And um, related to that is that, as the authors say, generally speaking, the greater the number of participants, the higher the power of the statistical test. Um, You'll learn more uh, detail about power and why the number uh, can be so important in um, obtaining higher power results uh, when you take a statistics class. So it's not, um, you know, something to get freaked out right about right now. You'll learn more about it later um, in a, a statistics class where you actually learn more uh, details about probability. Um, and so again, you want to um, use your literature review as a guide concerning the number. Uh, then they talk about um, apparatus. And in um, psychological research, uh, apparatus generally has to do with um, 
what kind of um, measures you're going to use, and um, which which is your independent variable. And so uh, your independent variable is going to be limited by the type of um, by your finances and by your ingenuity or creativity. Um, and so uh, sometimes you might you know, researchers might choose a very expensive um, test, and tests can be tests or questionnaires or inventories. Those sometimes can be very expensive because they've had a lot of testing done on them for reliability and validity. And so, but because of the literature review, you know, researchers can see that a particular uh, questionnaire or test has um, been used by a lot of other researchers, and so it could be worth the money. Um, so they talk about, you know, some scientific apparatus if you're using animals and, and things like that. And so, you know, there, there could be other things that you would use in, uh, uh, with your independent variable and your participants. Um, you know, they mentioned Skinner boxes and, and food, but a lot of people in psychology also, uh, have different kinds of apparatus uh, in uh, psychological research. If you remember uh, Milgram's obedience studies, he had those um, fake uh, shock machines. Uh, so that, that, that would be another uh, example of an apparatus. Um, and they talk about uh, how you would record uh, your observations. Um, and we discuss again uh, being inconspic inconspicuous and also, um, you know, how to uh, some of the some of the things to consider when you're uh, thinking about how you're going to take your measurements or obtain your data and um, why uh, you might want to figure out how to be as inconspicuous as possible um, and that sometimes the simplest method may be the best even though something some other method may be you know high tech or something that may not necessarily be the best method uh, to choose uh, then the authors talk about experimenter characteristics and how they can influence um, your uh, research um, And so physiological characteristics, age, sex, uh, race, can um, uh, affect participants. Um, interestingly, they uh, talk about a, um, a research by Rosenthal, a, a study by Rosenthal that showed that male experimenters are more friendly to their participants than female. Very interesting. I hadn't heard that before. Um, another example of uh, age, sex, and race, um, in my uh, dissertation research, uh, the participants in my study on sheltered battered women were from three different ethnic groups, um, Caucasians, Hispanic Americans, and African Americans, and um, I hired uh, only women, hired and trained only women uh, to interview them, and I hired uh, women of the same ethnic group to uh, um, interview of women of that ethnic group because research does show that um, people of one ethnic or racial category tend to be more open and um, would be more likely to uh, uh, share their you know true uh, selves uh, if they're being interviewed by someone who they view as um, being similar to them. So, uh, so those are things that you have to keep in mind um, as well. Um, and they talk about experimenter expectancies and how um, a researcher's expectations concerning their participants' behaviors can and do affect performance. Um, and so you just need to be aware of that and figure out how um, you're going to try to control for that. Um, they even meant the authors of the text even mentioned how uh, rats 
have been shown to perform in accordance with what the experimenter anticipates. Pretty amazing. Um, and so the, the studies that they summarized highlight how strong the effects of the experimenter expectancies can be on participants' performance. And so uh, you've got to be careful and consider how to reduce the Rosenthal effects. Um, and they discuss uh, some ways uh, to do that um, by single blind, double blind experiments, things like that. Um, and then uh, participant perceptions as extraneous variables. And so they discuss um, how uh, participants can, um, their, their perceptions, their uh, beliefs, their um, expectations can also um, affect results and be extraneous and nuisance variables. So they uh, discuss some aspects of that demand characteristics um, when uh, people are trying to perform according to what they think are the demands of the experimenter. Um, and so uh, most people who participate in studies, they want to be, they want to feel like they are being good participants and so they they want to perform well. Um, I think most of us have had that experience, um, you know, like being in a class or being around someone that you respect or admire or, um, you know, some kind of quality. You want to you want to appear to be good around them or, you know, something like that. And so those are things that we have to keep in mind. Um, response bias. bias. So there can be some research participants and unknowing, unknowing not, they are not aware of this themselves, but um, some people in, in some, at some times may uh, say yes to everything or may say no to everything. Um, people who tend to say yes to everything is called the socially desired response. Um, and they discuss how, uh, the authors discuss the, um, how participants can uh, have a response set where they um, are responding how they think the uh, experimenter or the people involved in the research want them to. And uh, other things can influence how people react to. Um, you know, the, the, the authors discuss the setting. I mean, just about anything that. Uh, is in the environment or you know what happened to someone just before the experience. I mean all of these things can affect um, people's responses um, but in one thing with the socially desirable response you can't control for that all the time but there is a way in um, questionnaires that researchers have figured out how to um, control for socially desirable responses where they um, build in ways to um, kind of counteract that. So they give an example in Table 7-1 of controlling for socially desirable responses for people who tend to say yes or for people who tend to say no. So um, in, in a, as an example for a questionnaire and maybe for an interview, but it would be a little bit more difficult, but for questionnaire you can build in, you can design in um, socially desirable uh, Questions that that can get at uh, responses that are uh, merely socially desirable, as opposed to um, you know like more accurate or more truthful kinds of answers. So there is a way to um, control for this in some uh, kinds of experiments. And so um, when controlling for participant effects, that's where um, single and double blind experiments can come in handy. Uh, double blind is where um, neither the experimenter know that, nor the participant knows who's getting what, who's going to be in what treatment. Um, and uh, because of the demand characteristics and the response set, um, these are other reasons why um, deception may be appropriate. 
if you're if deception is is an appropriate way to control for um, you know experimenter bias and or um, participant bias um, you know if you're trying to control for both then a double blind experiment um, you can can help with that you still have informed consent people still need to know that they may or may not be in the experimental group and they may or may not be receiving the actual treatment that is informed consent that's not deception um, so people will know that um, however they may not be informed of the entire purpose of the research so um, you know the the authors of the text go into that a little bit more about how um, sometimes you know leaving a, a portion of the entire study out of the um, procedure you know informational procedure to the participants may be appropriate um, so uh, so these are things that researchers have to carefully review and the literature review helps with that making that kind of determination you know is deception appropriate and the IRB can also help um, determine that um, and uh, and then they dis the authors discuss a little bit more about um, yes sayers and response sets and then and then the uh, authors discuss um, research and um, culture and some of the aspects of uh, culture that need to be um, or could be considered in uh, research, especially in uh, subjects, fields like psychology and sociology, anthropology. Um, I, I think, you know, I think culture is a little bit challenging to um, define. I've seen this kind of definition, like one that's in your chapter in many books, and, um, you know, I think it's really broad and, and kind of vague lasting values, lasting attitudes, lasting behaviors that are shared and transmitted to generations. Uh, you know, it's a subject for a different uh, topic, but um, I just think it's kind of interesting. So anyway, they discuss, the authors discuss some of the um, issues that uh, researchers um, could consider when they're um, discussing research. and. You know, they're, they're, the authors of this textbook, as many research-related textbooks are do, the authors are going over um, a variety of things that researchers can consider, in some cases must consider, in some cases should consider. Um, there's no way one study can um, account for all of these things that um, a researcher would need to uh, account for in a study. There's no way that every study could do that. Um, and so some of these are going to be more relevant to some studies than others. And you, you make judgment calls, um, and you make them based on the literature review, based on experience, based on uh, you know, mentors or peers who are, who are willing to help guide you. Um, but just keep in mind that there's a lot of stuff in here that, that the authors of the text say you, people need to consider when doing research, and that's true. But you can't do all of it in one study. So um, you make judgment calls. When is culture really important in a particular study? As an example, you know, when is response set really important? When is... Uh, deception important you know all of those things you you consider but not all the time um, so then uh, you know discuss some of the effects that culture may have on different aspects of research um, your choice of the research problem nature of experimental hypothesis selection of the independent and dependent variable um, and certainly, you know, in in my um, my my study with sheltered better women and choosing women from three different ethnic groups, I considered culture um, 
and more specifically ethnicity uh, in my study. So it was definitely part of um, my information and my literature review and you know, really looking at those um, aspects um, more so than, say, deception or response uh, set or um, uh, socially desirable results, you know, things like that. So I focused more on the ethnicity, um, race, culture uh, aspect than I did on some other things. Um, type of survey or questionnaire used so on page 144. Um, the uh, type of survey or questionnaire uh, definitely needs to be considered uh, when you're um, working with people, uh, especially whose Engl uh, English is not their first language. So they talk about um, translation and then back translation. Um, so, for example, in um, my research with sheltered battered women, I considered for a while. Um, including women who could only speak Spanish. But because of the cost and the time for translating and then back translating the um, questionnaires that I was going to use, I ruled that out. So I only used English speakers in my study. So again, a judgment call. Um, which is something that you, you want to consider. And then they talk about a cultural response set. And so you know, when you're talking to someone from a particular group, you know, will they have more of a tendency to respond in a certain way, partially because of the um, group or culture that they are um, coming from? Um, and so, uh, you know, at the end of the chapter, they say, um, you know, the purpose is not to teach all the fine points of cross-cultural research, and that's true. This book could not um, cover that. There are books that cover only that. Um, so they want you to, to be aware of the, the issues and um, be thinking about how things like this can affect internal and external validity, statistics, and research design, and, uh, and to acquaint you with um, different aspects for culture. And so, so... They make this point about culture, and it's true for the entire book. The entire book is to help you be more aware of different um, aspects of research and um, have a good foundation of some of the important concepts and um, issues that you need to be thinking about. Um, but it's by no means a comprehensive, um, detailed Aspect, uh, you know, text about everything, and again, uh, when you're doing a study, you're not going to be looking at every single component or concept that they discussed in this textbook. textbook. You'll be um, looking at some in certain research studies and not others, and then for other research studies, other things will be more important than um, they may have been in, in other studies that, that you conduct or people in general conduct this research. So, um, so just keep that in mind that, um, you know, this is an introductory, uh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, it's an introductory uh, class and text on um, an overview of some of the more important concepts and um, things to be aware of in research, but um, it's not a, a detailed one, but it's also, uh, you know, that you don't have to consider each and everything every time you do a research project. So, hope you found this a little bit helpful and interesting, and I will stop for now and see you in the discussion board.